and chant on the five recollections. Reflecting on aging, illness, death, separation, and the principle of karma. So it recreates the dynamic that the Buddha himself went through, the chain of events that led up to his leaving the palace, going out in the wilderness. There are two versions of the story. One is simply said he reflected on the fact that he was subject to aging, illness, and death. He needed to find a way out. Looking for happiness and other things that were subject to aging, illness, and death was not a noble thing. The noble thing to look for was something that wasn't subject to those things. That was the one noble search in life. The question being, can you, through your own efforts, go beyond aging, illness, and death? The more dramatic version of the story talks about how he was sheltered from seeing anybody old, ill, or dead in his younger years. Until one day he went into the city in his chariot. He had to leave the palace. He'd been, he was sick and tired of being cooped up in the palace, wanted to see what the world outside was like. And despite all of his father's efforts to prevent any untoward thing from happening, he saw an old person. He asked his charioteer, what's wrong with that person over there? And the charioteer said, well, don't you know, that's it's an old person. Is he the only one? No, of course we all become old. The prince went back to the palace and reflected on this. Next time he goes out, he sees a sick person. The next time he goes out, he sees a dead person. And the answers are always the same. What's wrong with that person? Well, is he the only one who has those problems? No, everybody is going to go through that. And the prince went back and reflected on all the pleasures he had, all the people he loved. If he was going to die, that meant he was sure to be separated from all these people. And then finally he saw a forest mendicant, thinking, and he realized if there's any way to find a, a way out of this problem, it's through that life, cutting down on your responsibilities and going off into the forest and having a chance to really look into your mind. to see what the potential of human action is. Can it, can it really overcome these problems? Now, the story may strain credulity in the sense that the Prince lived to be twenty-something, had never seen any of these people, but it has a psychological reality. In the sense, we oftentimes we go through life very oblivious to the fact that aging, illness, and death lie in wait for us. And this is how life closes. And then one day it really hits us really hard. There's a certain period of life where everything seems to be developing and growing and getting better and better. We're getting more and more mature. We're getting more and more capable. And then we start seeing these things slipping away and realizing that's how it all ends. It all goes. And it starts calling into question all the accomplishments we've had in the course of our life. if there's nothing that goes beyond aging, illness, and death. And then the question is, are we just going to stuff those thoughts back into a corner of the mind and pretend like we haven't realized them, or are we going to take that realization seriously and see what we can do about it? Do you have any fighting spirit in you? Would you like to try to fight and go beyond those things? That's the question the Buddha asked himself. And the life of the forest mendicant was what opened the door.
So this is why that fifth reflection is on the principle of action. The Buddha found that the most important thing you can explore is how far can your own abilities go in bringing about true happiness, a happiness that lies beyond the limitations of aging, illness, and death. That's a noble life, a life well spent. He told himself even he didn't f attain that goal, the fact that he had strived in that direction, that would mean that his life was well spent. Which is also why, on the night of his awakening, most of his insights were insights into the nature of human action. One that this life that we're living right now is not the first one we've lived. We've had many before this. And the whole course of our lives has been shaped by our actions. And then his final insight was that it wasn't just actions coming from the past that shaped the present, it's also our present actions shaping the present as well. And these are the important ones. These are the ones that make all the difference between pleasure and pain, bondage and freedom. So this is why when we meditate, we're meditating on the present moment. because. We're always acting, we're always making choices in the present moment, and for, for the most part they, they're under the radar. We don't realize what we're doing. And because we don't realize what we're doing, we're not especially all that skillful about it, and because we're not skillful we end up creating a lot of stress and suffering for ourselves. This is why it's so important to take the time to really look into the present moment. What have you got here? What's going on here? How many things coming through the mind are just simply waves of influence coming from the past? And how many things are happening because of choices you're making right now? You can't do much about the past. The past is done. But you can do a lot about how you're reacting to the potentials that the past provides you right now, right now, right now. When I first went to stay with a John Fu, I asked him about the whole issue of past lives, because I'd heard some people say that the Buddha never really taught about past lives, and other people saying that he had. And his answer was, the important thing to, to believe in when you're practicing here is not that issue. The issue is the principle of karma, that you shape your experience, And that meditation is an exploration of exactly how you shape it and how much you shape it, and are there ways to shape it skillfully. Otherwise your meditation simply becomes a sitting here waiting for something to happen, to be enlightened from outside, or to just have something happen accidentally fall into place. But if you realize it's some, you're doing an awful lot here in the present moment, and psychologists have discovered there's just an awful lot going on, just the way the mind keeps tabs on the body. There's a lot of information coming in, and the mind has to sort through which things are important to focus on and which things are not. Then it's developed a sort of a regime that is goes on automatic pilot unless something really bad happens. And so the often our awareness of the body just gets blocked out because we're more interested in other things. And so that whole level of choices and intentions and decisions gets blocked out of our awareness. And unless you take the time to drop your focus on things outside and turn your focus things on things inside, you're never going to see this. This is why it's important to take this time, because this is, this is a noble activity. Seeing into your actions, understanding their potential, understanding their power. Seeing exactly what your choices are, what your intentions are, how many layers of intention are there in the mind. So the initial premise of the meditation is that our actions are important, and then the discoveries are to see exactly how important they are. 
And one way of doing that is try to make whatever intentions you're conscious of, whatever choices you're conscious of, as skillful as you can. skillful as they can be, and then see what that does to how you experience day-to-day -day reality, how do you experience your, your inner reality. Little Buddha talked about the time when his path finally got on the right path, although when his practice got on the right path, it was when he simply learned how to divide his thoughts into two sorts. There were skillful thoughts and unskillful ones in terms of the states of mind they led to. In other words, seeing his thoughts not as, in terms of their content, he saw them more as part of a cause and effect chain, elements in a chain of cause and effect. Where does this thought leave? What does it do to the mind to think a thought like this? And he found that thoughts that imbued with sensual passion, ill will, and harmfulness really did harm the mind, whereas thoughts that were inclined more towards renunciation, lack of ill will, lack of harmfulness, those are really good for the mind. And so we learned how to keep the first sort in check. So it was like a cowherd. Every time he saw the cows going into somebody else's property, or you could tap and check them and poke them to make sure they stayed where they where they belonged. As for skillful thoughts, he would he could let them roam around, like the cow herd in the after the rice has been harvested and in India. That was the time when the cows had pretty much had free range; they didn't have to worry about stepping on somebody's crops. So I had to think about where well, there are cows out there. but you don't have to ride herd on them as much. With one exception, we realize that even skillful thinking, if there's a lot of it, it tires the mind. So the next more skillful step was to incline the mind into right concentration, bring it into states of solid absorption, the real resting spots for the mind. And he pursued these and found that they became more and more and more refined they were in stages. Until he reached the point focusing on his breath, where the breath stopped throughout the body, his awareness filled the body. He said like a like a bright awareness filling the body like a white cloth and entirely envelops the body. And then he inclined his mind to the issue, okay, exactly. How can you put an end to suffering? Until he saw the mind clearly in the present moment creating suffering for itself through its intentions. And every place he saw the mind was creating suffering, he would let go, stop that particular activity. until he had himself cornered. He couldn't any intention in any direction he realized was going to create some sort of suffering. Even the intention to stop creating suffering was going to be an intention. And at that point his perception of stress was so subtle that he could he could sense that as well. That's when the mind totally stopped intention. Even without intending to it just totally stopped right there because it was in the right place to do it. And that was when his mind tasted the deathless, total unbinding, the total freedom. He'd found what he'd been looking for. And it was on the basis of that that he was able to teach for another 45 years and help other people find that same freedom. through exploring this process. Well, what does it mean to act? What is a person doing when he or she is acting? What is the act? The act is the intention. 
How many times do you act in the course of the day? You're acting all the time. It's your mode of being. The way you act is how you define yourself. So instead of carrying your notions of who you are around that you've got to be this way, you've got to be that way, I'm this kind of person, I'm that kind of person, just look at how you act. Look at everything, even your sense of who you are, as types of action. And look at whether they're skillful or not. So this is why that reflection on karma, the last one there, it sounds very simple, very basic, and it says, you know, it's kindergarten Buddhism. If you do good, you get good results. You do bad, you get bad results. But it's exploring that basic principle that can take you all the way. This is why it's an important reflection. It's also why it's the way out. Those first four reflections. Or meant to give rise to a sense of some wega, which means a sense of dismay, a sense of urgency, a feeling that you're trapped and you've got to find some way out. You can't let the way things are continue. And then the fifth reflection on the principle of karma, that's meant to give rise to a sense of what's called basada, or confidence. Yes, there is a way out, and it's through your actions. So the question that faces all of us, are you up for the challenge? There's a long line of people that goes back over 2,500 years that have been up for the challenge. And your question is, are you going to join them? <laughs>